Good morning, Riverside Church. We are so glad that you're joining us wherever you're, you're the, you are this morning, whether it's at home in front of your couch or in your car. We are excited to have you here with us. Let's worship the Lord and raise a hallelujah this morning. Would you do that with us? I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm gonna sing in the middle of a storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the King is alive.
every way, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed.
glad that you chose to spend part of your weekend with us. I'm JL Yeomans, the Kid Director here at Riverside, and I have a few announcements for you this morning. If you want any more information about any of the things I mentioned, check out our website or the Riverside app. If this is your first time joining us online, welcome. We are so happy that you joined us. We want you to know that church is so much more than a Sunday service and we would love for you to comment right now 
I'm new in the comments and our team will be in contact with you via messages so we can help you get connected to our family. This is the time in our service where we get to give back a part of what God has given us. And there are a number of ways that you can do this. You can give by mail, online, or by text. We are so thankful for your generosity. On February 20th, we will be having a princess tea party for mothers and daughters who are aged three and above. Dress in your princess best, be pampered, take photos, enjoy dainty little finger foods, darling teacups, a red carpet entrance, and so much more. Tickets for this event are $5 a daughter. This is an outreach event, so think of other mothers and daughters that you know and invite them to. Bring neighbors, classmates, friends, anyone you'd like to bless. Buy a ticket for them and ask them to join you on February 20th. We can't wait to share this incredible event with you. For more information and to purchase your tickets, go to riversidechurch.org slash disciplingkids or you can find that information on our kids page of our app. A few months ago, we introduced a new mission partner called Better Together. This organization desires to prevent child abuse and neglect with an alternate to foster care. There are many opportunities to partner with Better Together in this mission. If you would like more information about them or you're just ready to get involved, they are hosting a volunteer training here at Riverside on Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. Register at riversidechurch.org slash missions or on the local missions page of the app. Children need you and together we can help. Student ministry at Riverside is growing and we are looking for men and women who love Jesus and just want to pour into the next generation of this church. We want to add to our small group leadership staff and to our setup team. If you're interested, visit riversidechurch.org slash students or the students page on the app. Well, Riverside, that's all I have for you this day. Steve is here with his final message in our home series. We'll see you next week. Hello, Riverside. It's good to be with you today. My name is Steve Pruitt, and we would love to hear from you to, he to hear how you're doing. So please let us know in the comments. Let's pray and we will open the word together. Father, I am grateful for your word, for time to open it week after week, to be reminded of the truth that is there, the goodness of there, the story that you've given us, Lord, not only so that we may know you, but that we may pass it down so others can come to know you. And we pray that you would help us be that as a people, a people who intentionally Engage the generations around us to tell of your greatness. In Jesus' name, amen. Today is Sunday, January the 24th, three weeks into 2021. Did you make any New Year's resolutions? If you did, last Sunday was the official ditch day. They say that 60% of New Year's resolutions fail by last Sunday, two weeks in. Although I'm betting 2021 was different. I don't think the rate will change much. I just don't think people made resolutions this year. We're just hoping to be rid of this virus and to not have a civil war. But at the first of 2020, a year ago, we made resolutions. They look like this. Half of us pledged to manage our money better, to eat healthier, or to be more active. What went wrong? Because if you go through our history of this past year, we know that's not what people actually did. You, you set one little simple goal at the beginning of the year and then most fail two weeks later by January 15th. 2020, right after ditch week, another month and a half, the pandemic hit and people gave up. It was too complicated. It was too difficult, too discouraging. There are a people in a book called Deuteronomy, a book in your Old Testament. It's actually the fifth book in the Bible. And this word means second 
law. It's a retelling of the whole account, uh, what happened in the four books before it. It goes from God raising up Moses to deliver his chosen people from slavery and all the way through Moses raising Joshua to lead them into the promised land. In the fifth chapter, it reviews the Ten Commandments, the big ten, thou shall have no other gods before me. You've heard these. And at verse 27, it recalls the people telling Moses, go near and hear all that the Lord our God will say, because Moses is going to the mountain to talk to him, and speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you, and we will hear and do it. We will hear and do it. If you know the story, you know it didn't go well. The next book, book of Joshua, by chapter 5, it says, For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. It's the same ones who saw the miracles, the parting of the Red Sea, the, the freeing from slavery in Egypt through those plagues. They were guided by the glory of God. In the day there would be a column of cloud and at night a pillar of fire that would lead them. The ones who said, you find out what the Lord says, Moses, we will hear and do it. But they did not do it. They did not obey. So what went wrong? They had one little goal at the beginning of the promise and then they fail with one, one generation. We've been talking these past two weeks. The purpose of Riverside is to make and send disciples of Jesus. Now, disciple can sound complicated. It just means student, followers. And to do that, we believe we need to recognize that the church is home for the people of Jesus. This is the place where we, as a community, teach, encourage each other, bring others in so we need love and acceptance. And over the next few years, we're specifically going to focus on home and helping kids thrive. We're going to focus on helping people get healthy inside and outside in our community and generations be intentional, connected, interdependent, unlike the one that God made wander in the desert for 40 years because he refused to let them inherit the land he promised due to their disobedience. Deuteronomy, fifth book of the Bible need to understand the goal. Turn over to this fifth book, get to chapter six in your Bible. We need to understand what the goal was, see what God wanted, so we can see what went wrong. We'll see at least two problems in there that we should avoid, things that we still struggle with. And then we're also gonna talk about two things that we will try to do as a church to help generations be intentional. So let's read it, starting with Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Maybe you've heard those words before. It's the beginning of a prayer said by Jewish people at least once a day for well over 3,000 years, more like 3,500 years. It's called the Shema or the Shema Yisrael because that's this word, the first word there, Shema. And Yah Israel is this word. It means hear, O Israel. And verse 4 goes like this. This is my best effort, so some of you can do this better. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. It means, hear, O Israel, sorry, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. It continues in verse 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. There were two commands in the Shema. Did you catch them? The first was there in verse four. Hear, hear what? Hear that God is one. Specifically, Adonai is one. Adonai is the word that was used for uh, the name of God. It'll say Lord in all caps in your translations. It's translating Yahweh, it's his name. He is God, he is one, and he is the only one. It's the first command, hear. Second command, Love him, love him. Specifically, you, you singular, this is not plural here, it's you, you individually love him with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. Someone asked me this week how you love him with all your might, your strength. That's a really good question. When Jesus was asked, 
what the greatest commandment was. He quoted this, quoted from Deuteronomy. He says it here in Matthew. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That is the great and first commandment. He didn't say might. He said mind. Usually when people in the New Testament, the, the back half of the Bible that explains the coming of Jesus, when they quote the Old Testament, if the words differ, it's because the people in the New are quoting from a Greek translation, not from the more ancient Hebrew. But that's not the case here. Here, Jesus changes it. Why? We don't know. He has the right. He wrote it. Maybe others had been confused and he was clarifying. It had been centuries since they really spoke ancient Hebrew, since God had spoken to Moses in that language. And maybe he was adding some clarification of what was intended when it had been revealed way back then. I do know he helps expose what's behind the command. To love God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might means you love God fully with your whole being, with all you are, all you have. In other words, you put God first. Period. There's one God, this one. Put him first. Period. So what went wrong? God made it clear. He even gave his people a way to keep this straight. If you keep reading the next verse now, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 6. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The people of God, the Jewish people at that time, they took this seriously. They took these words starting with the Shema that we read on through verse 9. And then they added a second passage from chapter 11 in Deuteronomy that restates part of this. And they wrote them on their doors. Anybody ever been to a Jewish home? Did you see one of these there? It's called a mezuzah. It's a little box and it has a scroll inside it, usually sealed. I opened mine so I can read it. The scroll is this, this a little better. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, verse 4 through 9, and then a second passage, Deuteronomy 11, verses 13 to 21. There it is in English. In the second passage, it tells them basically, it repeats, writing it on binding it, but it's, you put me first and I will take care of you. I'll take care of everything, food, rain, all of it. And this marking that's on the front of the mezuzah. There's usually some version of this on there. It's often a stylized version of this letter. This is a Hebrew letter. It's called Shin. This is the first letter in Shema. It's that letter, because that's what's in the box. It's also what's in the phylacteries. Have you ever heard of those? Those are little boxes worn during prayer. I think it's Tephilim is what people call them now. Jesus talked about these. He talked about the religious hypocrites and their phylacteries. He said, this is in Matthew also, they do all their deeds to be seen by others for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long to be seen. They made the boxes big. They used to put the scroll in the phylactery and wear it on their head and wear it on their, they still do, but it had changed and been corrupted and now they did it to be seen and made it big. What went wrong? God was establishing a culture for his people. This is how they will live. A culture where you will put God first and he can care for his people. He will provide for them. He will protect them. And his people were to carry this in their hearts. They were to teach it to their children when they sat, when they walked, when they lied down, when they got up all the time. Write it on your doorpost. Bind it to your hands and wear it between your eyes. Put God first. And by the time Jesus came for us, it had become a show. If you research this in 2021, you'll find that different religious teachers still 
teach on how low on your head the box is supposed to be or how big to make it or whether on the doorpost the mezuzah should the mezuzah should tilt in or out and do you just put it on the front door or do you put one on all the doors it's still argued about and even worse some communities will treat it like a talisman like a charm that can cause blessing if you do it just right you get careful to get an authorized scribe to perfectly write each word on a perfect type of parchment because if you mess it up well then god won't bless you guys that's magic that's not faith you're treating it like a charm it was never about the box it was never about the mezuzah or the scroll in it it was about the relationship god says put me first and do these things to remember that and i will take care of everything i'll provide i will protect love god with everything in you but what went wrong well, people drift from loving relationship to empty ritual. We lose the plot. We go from um, the function and we make it about the form, what it was for, and then we start to just stick with what happened or what we did. We make it about the box. Instead of growing in trust, you start going through the motions. And these people failed to teach their children. Moses taught it to Joshua. Joshua teaches it and he leads Israel. He leads them into the promised land. His death is recorded in the book of Judges uh, at um, when he was 110 years old. And right after his death is recorded, this is Judges chapter 2, it's the Old Testament, it says this, and all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. This is Joshua's generation. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. The first generation watched God free them from Pharaoh. Second generation renewed the covenant under Joshua. Third generation rejected God and turned away. Maybe the older generation tried, but the young one was arrogant and rejected them. Instead of seeing them as wise, they just saw them as in the way. Or maybe once their needs were met, they got out of the desert, they got through those wars, they got their own land, and things were good, maybe then they just forgot about God and how He got them there. That pattern repeats over and over through the Bible until by the time that Jesus comes, they had lost the relationship. They were teaching rituals. And they were making a show. And the leaders were teaching a form of religion that had little to do with faith in and love of God. And what was being passed to the kids was a burden, not a blessing. Who wants to learn? There's no way to please God, which is not what God taught. That's how people messed it up. Now, what do you do? You walk in a relationship or have you settled for a ritual? Are you living in relationship with God that's defined by carrying His Word in your heart? Or are you busy practicing penance and reciting memorized prayers and feeling like you're always doing it wrong? Or maybe now that he saved you or he got you through bankruptcy or he got you through addiction, he got you through COVID or through grief or any of the good things that he's done in your life, now that you're there, maybe you moved on and forgot about him and how he cared for you back then when it was so hard. You go read in your old prayer journal those days you were crying out and then now, years later, things are good and you forgot. You forgot. Maybe you wrote it on the wall once, but you slowly moved it off the wall and into the back room or into the garage. And the joy that you used to have in remembering how God has cared for you, how He's protected you, how He's provided for you, how He's loved you, that turns into a forgotten story that you used to tell. The God who saved you and wants you to teach it to your kids, to teach it in your home, with your friends, when you rise and when you sit and when you walk, and the one who calls you to carry him in your heart and write it on your doors to remind you so you won't forget, he wasn't building rituals, he was building a culture, a people who would be defined by this relationship, and it would be the central aspect of their homes and their lives. He would be their identity, not a thing they did. If he becomes that, you'll find that your other relationships may follow. And that's what your kids will learn, the rituals. Your friends, your wife, your husband, they'll become things you do, 
instead of relationships which define you. And all the other things, new things, exciting things, you'll start to see those as more attractive because you forgot that anything good that exists in this world is from Him. And you get it the way that He says He'll provide it to you or it will destroy you. It's a lie. You forget. Which is the other thing that went wrong, I think. People drift from God first to God sometimes. Or maybe God plus some other things that you worship. Other things sometimes will seem more important because you forget His promises, His goodness. His people were struggling with this before they ever got out of the desert. The first time that Moses came down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments, the people had already gotten tired of waiting and they made an idol, an object of gold that they could dance around, they could worship, they could have a party. They traded the one true God for something more immediate, something they could touch. Before he told them to put him first, he told them to listen, hear this. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's the first of those Ten Commandments. Hear this. One God, this God, no other gods. But they turned away. They chased false gods, better gods, gods who had prostitutes and booze, gods would, who would do what you want if you did the right rituals, at least that's what they claimed. This plagued God's people for over 2,000 years. Idols, false gods, false promises that enslave you. It still causes problems for us now in Christ, even in Jesus. Instead of putting Jesus first, people put Jesus sometimes. Instead of, God, what is your will? We pray, God, please bless my will. Did you notice the people who stormed the U.S. Capitol a couple of weeks ago? Did you see the video? The unedited video where they stood in the house chamber and a guy came up next to this guy and invoked the name of Jesus. They stood in that room after assaulting police officers, after threatening to kill any who dared challenge their rights as Americans, and then they prayed to Jesus. America first, then Jesus. That's backwards. It's backwards. That's not Jesus first. That's Jesus sometime when he does what you think he should do for you. You're asking him just to come in and bless what you're already worshiping. So what can we do? If God's people have always struggled to pass it on, to pass our faith, our relationship with God down from old to young, not passing down rituals and forms of religion, but passing down a loving walk with the living God, well, what can we do? You remember this? There's no shortcut to being faithful, but we must be faithful in the right things. This passage, I'm going to show it to you, 2D2, 2, remember that? It, it tells us what our culture should be, and we have to be intentional and diligent to build it. Churches get distracted by other goals. Well, this is the goal, 2D2, 2, 2 Timothy 2, 2. What you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust of faithful men or women who will also, who will be, who will be able to teach others also. There's four generations in here. Look at that. What Timothy had heard from Paul, Timothy's you, Paul's me, also in trust of faithful men, I think this is inclusive, faithful people, who will be able to teach others also. Four, four generations. You pass it down. We make disciples. That can't just be a program of the church. That's got to be our DNA, our identity, our culture. And at Riverside, we want, we believe, this is behind everything we do. We're teaching people to follow Jesus, to be changed by Jesus, to enter into his mission then. We have training, our DS1 thing, a Disciple Shift 1. It's to teach this. Our life groups are to facilitate this. It sets up discipling relationships. Men's, women's ministries, the porch, they're setting up intentional discipleship relationships. Our students' ministry, the small groups are for discipleship. The kids' ministry is built with the intention of moving kids and discipling relationships. We believe in recovery ministries. 
but also believe they're only one step. That's foot in the door to help people get healthy so you can grow as a disciple. It's about discipleship. We have pathways to counseling. We have Zoom groups meeting. This is why we do what we do. I spent 30, uh, well, I didn't spend 30. 30 years ago, as a youth pastor, I was trained in this disciple-making model called Sun Life, and I was taught that this is what Jesus taught. It's what he modeled. That led me to make a personal mission statement. They made us do this. It wasn't just what do I do in ministry, it's what am I for? What's the purpose of Steve Pruitt? I agonized over this. It took me so long to write it, partly because I wanted the words to be perfect. I didn't think, oh wait, I could modify it. Anyway, I determined with agony, my personal mission was to enlist, equip, and empower disciple makers. You can see the neurotic need for alliteration there. I added words over time. I talked about student disciple makers. I would add, or for life, it becomes a lifetime model, not a one-time event. First time in uh, 2012, I became a lead pastor in Northeast Atlanta suburb. It was a church that was kind of starting over, and we needed to figure out mission. In the midst of that, I kind of lost track of my own. It took me a while to recover that, to realize I had lost my own purpose in the midst of what I was trying to do ministry-wise. When you find that back, it's amazing how it clarifies things. Some of you may make disciples through your trade. I exist to use this gift to point other people to Jesus, or to decide, whatever that is. It may be through your wisdom, your experience, your skills, your, I don't know, fill in the blank. What's God done in your life? Who's he made you and how does he want to use that? There's a good chance that's part of who you are. Write it down. I've got a little Bible study guide. It's kind of out of context, but it's really helpful for this. You can use it. There's three ways you can get it from me. If you go on the Riverside app, it'll be under the This Sunday link. You can click that. It'll be on social media later this afternoon, so Instagram or Facebook or something, you can find it there. Or out if you're here live, you can go to our Next Step desk and leave your email there and we'll send it to you digitally. It helps you to poke your head up and get a look at who you are and what you specifically, you, are for. You don't retire from that. It's who you are. We make disciples. That's what we do. To help keep that central, to help it stay identity, culture for us as Riverside, we also celebrate steps in that direction. Whenever someone comes to Christ or gets baptized, makes a decision based on what Jesus would want, makes a lost friend, we celebrate every step in the direction of Jesus, every step that puts God first. That sounds simple, but most of us are not good at it. I'm not good at it. We drift. I drift. We lose sight of why the mezuzah is on the door and we start kissing it like a charm. So we celebrate every step to try to help us remember the culture that we're creating that God's called us to. At home, when you rise, when you sit, celebrate every action that puts God first. Write a family journal. Uh, record answered prayer as you're going through school or whatever. That it, Have special meals with friends or with your family for Jesus moments. At our home, we used to have a fruit plate. It's a picture of it. Our kids could nominate each other or mom or dad anytime they saw evidence of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Anytime they saw evidence of that, any of us saw it and anybody else, nominate them. And that night, that person would eat off that plate. We were creating ways to celebrate those steps toward Jesus. Now, that's not all we will be doing to be intentional generations. There's more coming. But this celebration thing is a big deal. And it's really difficult to maintain without help. As a church staff, we're currently celebrating steps as a staff, part of a group New Year's resolution, kind of. And I want to point out that Team 2 is winning right now. And I also want you to know that I am on that team. But these are the wrong kind of steps. These are Fitbit steps. It's important though because all of us want to be in better shape and most of us need some kind of challenge or celebration to actually do it. We need a community that celebrates the right things. That's what we want to do for discipleship, for intentional generations. That's the kind of home we want here. 
And it's the reason behind these giant acrylic letters. We're going to fill these up with steps, with little steps. Every time somebody makes a step toward Jesus, or God answers a prayer for your name in the seat, or someone, your friend, opens a Bible or prays for the first time, you'll get to put in a little step, a little foot, just like these. We've got a bunch on their way. We're going to start this next week. Uh, you can get one of those and be praying specifically for something, and when it happens, you can drop it in here. We'll use blue for baptism. We'll use green for salvation. The other colors we can kind of leave up to you to figure out what that'll look like. If you're at home, which is you guys, you can request that through a form. You can go to riversidechurch.org steps and put it in and we'll put the foot in for you. We'll start next week. We want to help generations be intentional. To do that, we make disciples. We celebrate every step in the direction of Jesus, every step that puts God first. Can we pray for that? Father, I confess that I am not always quick to notice your work, to point it out in the lives of others, to point it out in my life. And in the midst of that, Lord, sometimes we don't tell the stories. I don't pass them on like I want. And so, God, I pray that you would make us a people where discipleship's not something we do. It's who we are. We're marked as a people who've decided to put Jesus first. And God, we want to celebrate everything that happens in the lives of your people that magnifies him, that represents those steps toward Christ. Thank you for that, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I will see you soon. Old things have passed away. Your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again. You cause your sun to shine on darkest nights. For all that you've done, we will. Pour out our love, this will be a random song. Jesus, we love you. Oh, how we love you. You are the one. Our hearts adore.
Jesus.